Good morning and happy Resurrection Sunday to you. Today I want to share three things that you need to hear on Easter Sunday. You know, Easter is the celebration of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. We know what the cross means, but what does his resurrection mean? Is it just God demonstrating his power over death? No, he already did that with the resurrection of Lazarus out of that tomb. So what significance does the resurrection of Jesus Christ have for you and for me? Today we're going to talk about what it means to be clean and close and new. The finished work of Jesus Christ. He's no longer dying. He's no longer in the tomb. He has risen from the dead. It's over. It's done. You are clean. You are close. And you are new. To understand this better, we start with a very common religious lie. And here it is, Christians need to be forgiven by God daily. What's the truth about this? Well, we see the truth right here in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 14. It says, For by one offering he has perfected for all time those who were sanctified. You know what this means? It means that you're not being forgiven. That's right, you're not being forgiven progressively. You're not little by little or day after day or year after year trying to get clean and get forgiven before God. Because by one offering, you've been made perfectly forgiven forever. Do you hear this? Forgiveness is not progressive. It's not like paying off your car or paying your mortgage on your house. You're not paying for your sins little by little. Jesus paid it all one time, and it's over. Many years ago, perhaps you remember a government bailout. People were down at the banks apologizing. They had tears in their eyes and an apology on their lips and sorrow in their hearts. But guess what? The bank just wanted to get paid. Why? Because we don't have an apology-driven economy. We have a money-driven economy, right? Well, when it comes to your sins, do you realize that God, God doesn't have an apology-driven economy. He has a blood-driven economy for sins. We find this right here in Hebrews chapter 9. It says, without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. You're not being forgiven progressively because Jesus is not dying progressively. You're not being forgiven and cleansed daily because Jesus is not shedding his blood daily. Jesus died once. It worked the first time. No repeat needed. He will never do anything about your sins again. And so what's your job? What's our job? To wake up every day and say, wow, and thank you. And that's exactly what faith is. Faith says, wow, and thank you. You know, if you imagine it, a scene. I mean, long ago in the Old Testament, it never happened, but imagine it, a priest in a lazy boy chair. You walk in, and the priest is kicked back in that chair, and he looks at you, and he says, what's up? What would that mean? That would mean that the priest has no work to be done. He's sitting down on the job. But did you know that was never allowed? A chair was a forbidden piece of furniture in the Jewish tabernacle in the temple. Why? Because it would have meant there was no more work to be done. Look at him sitting there resting. It must be finished. But of course, it was never finished. Not in the Old Testament. Not under the law. The work to bring the people forgiveness from God was never done. It says right here in Hebrews 10, every priest does what? Stands daily ministering and offering time after time the same sacrifices which can never take away sins. But he, having offered one sacrifice for sins for all time, what did he do? He did the unthinkable. He sat down at the right hand of God. Do you see it? Jesus did what no other priest could do. 
he sat down on the job because it is finished. Now, I have a question for you today. Here we are, Easter Sunday, celebrating the finished work of Christ. He's risen from the dead. So, are you seated? Are you seated regarding your sins? Will you sit down with Jesus and agree that the sin issue is over? He says it's done. He doesn't need to do one single thing to make you clean or forgiven. You are already in him at his right hand, clean, close, and new. You know, I remember that film Groundhog Day. It was on during the holidays over and over and over, right? Maybe you remember. It still plays during Christmas at times. And it's about a guy who is stuck in the same day. He repeats the same day over and over again until he can get it perfect. And then he's allowed to escape that day and that repetition. With God, there is no Groundhog Day. He gets it right the first time. The wages of sin is death and Jesus dies and he pays the wages perfectly. No repeat needed. The cross worked and it is finished. With God, there is no Groundhog Day. Hebrews 7 says, Who has no daily need. Jesus has no daily need, like those high priests, to offer up sacrifices first for his own sins and then for the sins of the people because he did this once for all time when he offered up himself. Do you see it? In the Old Testament, they would get forgiveness in portions repeatedly, endlessly, day after day and year after year. They would go to the Day of Atonement. Imagine getting 365 days of your sins covered. Then you come out of that temple, you stub your toe on a rock, you use the Lord's name in vain. Now you've got to wait 365 days, another year, to get that one covered. It was progressive. It was paid off little by little. It was a temporary covering. And yet what Jesus did was once for all. You are not being forgiven. You are a totally forgiven person. Think with me. How many of your sins were in the future when Christ died? All of them, right? Your past sins, your present sins, your future sins... All of them were in the future when Christ died. He didn't make any distinction. He looked down the timeline of your sins and he says, I remember them no more. He's removed them as far as the east is from the west. He keeps no record of your wrongs. There is no clipboard. There is no scorecard. Your sins are gone forever, once for all. The book of Hebrews says, not again and again, not in portions. You are not being forgiven daily. You are a totally forgiven person. This is great news. I remember years ago, there was a mobile app that was released in your app store, whether you have iPhone or Android. The app was called I Confess. I kid you not. It was called I Confess, and you simply put in the sins of the day, whatever sins you've committed today, and then after you know, checking off those boxes, you fire up your confession, you hit the upload button, it fires the confession to the God of the universe, and then, and then you're waiting to see if you get that download, that message, and it says, you're forgiven. Now, we might chuckle at that, and it didn't last long in that app store. But, you know, there's a point that's being made there. If it's about you and your memory and your confession, then you're going to need more than a mobile app. You're going to need a supercomputer out of Washington to keep up with all your sins, to try to stay confessed up, to try to stay forgiven and cleansed. But do you see the truth of the gospel? It is not about your memory and your words. It's about Jesus Christ and His cross. It is not about you and what you're doing. It's about Him and what He did. Today is Sunday. We're celebrating the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Have we graduated from Friday? 
Do we recognize what happened just two days ago? That your sins were paid for in full and they'll never be paid for again? That you're a totally forgiven person so that you can now enjoy the resurrection life of Jesus Christ in you. An uninterrupted life, you have something unshakable, something unbreakable, because Jesus paved the way. The only thing that separated Adam and Eve from God was sin. The only thing that caused Jesus to say, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me, was the sins of the world that he was bearing. What's the only thing that could cause God to separate himself from you? Sins. But what did he do with your sins? He took them away. He removed them forever. He keeps no record of your wrongs. He doesn't take them into account. So now you have this uninterrupted life with Jesus. He'll never leave you. He'll never forsake you. And nobody can snatch you out of his hand. Lie number two that we're going to look at this Easter Sunday Christians are progressively getting closer to God. So very common to hear this, right? The idea that if you do enough Bible study, if you go to church enough, if you do your part, then you're basically inching closer to the God of the universe through what you do. Now, I've got some great news today. That is a religious lie. If you're going to be close to God, closeness with God is a gift. And you do not earn it or achieve it, you receive it. It is not by trying, but by trusting. And when you recognize what Jesus did in being crucified, buried, and raised for you, you can see then the gift of closeness from God. This was his agenda. He got it done. He hand delivers it to you on a platter, inviting you to feast on the goodness of the gospel, recognizing that he had to make you clean and he had to make you close. And only he could do it, and he did it perfectly, and it's done. It's finished. You are as close to God today as you will ever be. If you are in Jesus Christ, he has made you perfectly clean and perfectly close. We see this in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 17. It says, The one who joins himself to the Lord is one spirit with him. How can you get any closer than one spirit? Do you hear this? Do you see this in God's word? This is incredible. There's a lot of things that are in the Bible belt that are not in the Bible. And we keep believing this religious lie that we have to progressively get close to God and then we crack open the Bible and see what Jesus actually did. And he says, hey, I'm one spirit with you. I'm united with you. It's you and me and me and you, the vine branches relationship. He prayed for this. He longed for this. This closeness and intimacy that you have with Jesus was his idea. It was his agenda. It was his prayer request. And it has been answered with a resounding yes. You are one spirit with the Lord as close as you can possibly get. The year was 1886, and a man named Pemberton had invented the secret formula for Coca-Cola. That's right, he kept it under lock and key in a safe, and he kept it guarded from the public. But one day, he decided to brag. He invited the Atlanta Journal and Constitution to come and take a picture of him at his desk. And he had that formula for Coca-Cola seated It was sitting right there on the desk behind him, and he was posing for the photo with such pride. But he didn't count on something. The reporter was wise enough, smart enough, savvy enough to take that photograph and zoom in on that sheet of paper, and hence he discovered the secret formula for Coca-Cola. What was once a mystery was now revealed. Interestingly, the Apostle Paul says this in Colossians 1, the mystery which has been hidden from the past ages and generations, but has now been revealed, now manifested to the saints, 
to whom God willed to make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. This is the secret formula for the Christian life, Christ in you. You're not firing up long-distance phone calls to God, trying to reach Him. The calls are local, Christ in you, a mystery that was pre-planned for thousands of years prior, now revealed, Christ in you. You're not having to say, Lord, come, come Holy Spirit, fall fresh on us, come down into this place, come be with us. Do you see that the resurrection has given us something greater, and that is, He's not going to fall fresh because He lives in you forever. He doesn't need to fall fresh because He's sealed inside of you. You are sealed until the day of redemption. You have everything you need for life and godliness. He's blessed you with every spiritual blessing in Christ Jesus. You're complete and you're lacking nothing. So do you see how precious this gospel message is And when there's something out there, maybe in the Bible belt that's not in the Bible, we have to go with God's Word. We can't believe the lie that we are progressively getting closer when it's Him in us and us in Him, one spirit with the Lord, united with Christ, vine and branches. You know, fire normally destroys everything in its path. I remember here in Texas, we've certainly had our share of wildfires. In California, they've seen so many as well. Fire normally destroys everything in its way. But in the Old Testament, there's one story where that doesn't happen. And that's the story of the burning bush. You remember, God was in that bush. His presence was there, the angel of the Lord speaking to Moses, but it says the fire did not consume the bush. Wow, that's pretty cool to think about. The presence of the Lord without consuming the bush. The presence of the supernatural without consuming the natural. This reminds me of what it means to have Christ in us. It's not Christ instead of us. We're not a hollow tube. We're not a fire hose. We're children of God, and we get to be in it. He lives in us, and He expresses His life through us without consuming us. Maybe you've heard it's supposed to be all of Him and none of you. We have billboards here in Texas that say, More of Him, less of me. That sounds really good, really spiritual, like you're going to be a martyr and get rid of yourself. Less of you, more of Him. But you know, God already had that before creation. It was all of Him and none of us. Why did He create us and then pursue us and then save us and then indwell us? He's not trying to get rid of us. It's not more of Him and less of you. It's all of you and all of Him together in a beautiful union. This vine and branches relationship where you are perfectly clean and perfectly close because of the cross and the resurrection. Are you ready to recognize how incredible this gospel is that you get to be yourself and express Jesus at the same time? He's not asking you to fake it. He's not asking you to stuff yourself down or get rid of yourself. It's all of you and all of Him in a beautiful union together. You get to wake up every day, learn who you are in Christ, and be yourself. You're not an obstacle to God. You're His instrument. We read in John chapter 17, Jesus says that they may all be one, even as you, Father, are in me, and I in you, that they also may be in us, so that the world may believe that you sent me. Do you see what he's saying? Jesus is saying, Father, I want them to have the same unity, the same union, the same oneness that we enjoy. And do we have it? Was Jesus' prayer answered? Are you striving for something that Jesus simply asked for? You don't have to strive. It's not about trying. It's about trusting. 
It's not about achieving. It's about receiving. And when you called upon the name of the Lord to be saved, you were more than forgiven. God is more than a banker canceling your debt. He is more than a travel agent booking you for heaven. He has acted like a surgeon, infusing his very life inside of you through the resurrection of Jesus Christ, causing you to be born of the Spirit, born again, born of God. The gospel is incredible. The real thing is off the charts amazing. And we have so much to celebrate in Jesus. So I guess I want to ask, what if, what if we're always spending time with God? You know, we use that verbiage, are you spending time with God? And we mean, oh, I don't know, 14 minutes, 22 minutes with a book open at uh, 4 a.m., showing our dedication and our commitment, I'm spending time with God. Remember, the early church was illiterate. That's right. They couldn't read. They couldn't read the words on the page. 80% of them were illiterate. They couldn't have a quiet time. I guess they had to have a loud time. You know what I'm saying? But seriously, they didn't try to measure and chart their closeness with God through what they were doing. It wasn't about logging time in a book or logging time in a building to try to get close and stay close. I love the Bible. We don't have the message without the Bible. The Bible is God's Word, but do you hear me? It's not about reading the words on the page. It's about getting to know the author. You might read a history book to get to know history. You read a math book and memorize formulas to get to know math. But we read God's Word to get to know the author, Christ in you. He's the designer, the architect of life itself. He knows what we need. And he put his very life, his resurrection life, inside of us for a reason. He gave his life for us on that cross. And then he gave his life to us through the resurrection. And now he lives his life through us in every single moment. We get to be ourselves and express Jesus at the same time. What if you're always spending time with God? What if everything is spiritual? Taking the kids to school, working in the workplace? What if Christ is your life in all you do? You know, we hear it so much. There's idols in your heart. You love tennis too much. You love golf too much. You love your kids too much. You love your wife too much. You've got idols in your heart as if God is jealous and competing with these things. He is not competing with your hobbies and interests. He wants to be your life in the midst of everything. He's not in competition with your life. He is your life. And when we see how ginormous the success of this resurrection really is, we can celebrate our union with Christ and recognize that everything we do is spiritual. And everything we do can be an expression of Jesus, whether it's giving a cup of water in his name, helping the kids, attending to work at home, whatever it is, everything can be an expression of Jesus Christ. Now, here's the third thing that we all need to hear on Easter Sunday. Because there's a common lie out there. The common religious lie is that Christians have wicked hearts and fight against their own selves. Maybe you've heard this. You know, the, the worship leader is strumming on his guitar. He's mid-sentence. He looks up to heaven and he says, God, we've got wicked, wicked hearts, Lord. And everybody says, Amen. And we think that's humility to claim that we have wicked hearts. I thought you were born again. I thought he took out your heart of stone. I thought he gave you a new heart and a new spirit and his spirit. You don't have a wicked heart if you're in Christ. You've got a new heart. Your fight is not against yourself because you're the new self. Your old self died. You're a new creation. You've been raised from the dead. You don't have a wicked heart and your fight is not against yourself. We see this right here in Romans. It says, but thanks be to God 
that though you were slaves of sin, you became obedient from the heart to that form of teaching to which you were committed, and having been freed from sin, you became slaves of righteousness. Just like you were a slave of sin before, now you're a slave of righteousness. You're You're addicted to righteousness. You're allergic to sin. The Bible says count yourself dead to sin and alive to God. Does it sound like you're a dirty, rotten sinner? No, you're a holy, righteous saint. You're a new self and you're not fighting your own self. I remember my grandmother, she was late to her own funeral. I'm not, I'm not kidding. She was late to her own funeral, about three or four hours. We stood over the grave. There was a hole in the ground, and yet Grandma was nowhere to be found. Finally, finally, after many hours, the hearse driver shows up and delivers Grandma's body to be buried. The pastor was relieved, saying, I couldn't have gone any further anyway. I had no body to commit to the ground. I tell you this true story because I want to ask you something. Are you late to your own funeral? Have you signed your death certificate? Do you recognize that the gospel is more than Jesus dying for your sins? That you died with Jesus? We read this right here in the book of Galatians. I have been crucified with Christ. Notice that I, that's the first I, the old I, the old self. He says, it is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life which I now live, that's the new I, the new self. The life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself up for me. Die to self. You got to die to self. Have you heard this? It's all over the Bible belt, but did you know it's not in the Bible? That's right. The phrase die to self appears zero times in the scripture. The closest thing we have is Romans 6, which says your old self already died. So why would you try to die to self if you're the new self? Why would you try to die to self if God says, count yourself alive to him? But we're always looking to be dirty, rotten sinners. We're always looking to adopt that dirty, worm theology. But thank God for the resurrection. Because the resurrection changes everything. A dirty, rotten sinner didn't come out of that tomb. You're a slave of righteousness. A dirty, rotten sinner with a wicked heart did not come out of that tomb. You have been raised with Jesus Christ, and now you are new-hearted, and you've got a new spirit, and you've got God's spirit in you, and you want what God wants. We see it right here in Romans 6, knowing this, that our old self was crucified with him in order that our body of sin or body housing sin might be done away with so that we would no longer be slaves to sin. Now, I know what you're thinking. This sounds really good, that I'm a new creation, that I'm holy and righteous and blameless and new and my heart is good and it's not desperately wicked like they said in the Old Testament because I've got a new heart. But why do I still sin? I mean, if this is true, that I'm clean and I'm close and I'm new, then why do I still sin? Where do the yucky thoughts, where do the dirty thoughts come from if they're not coming from me? Well, the answer is they're coming from the flesh, and the flesh is not you. Have you ever gotten a new computer? I remember when I got my first shiny MacBook. I brought it home from Best Buy. I opened it. It was silver and beautiful and awesome. And I was so excited. I was on it about, I don't know, five minutes. And it said, I need a software update. Are you kidding me? A software update? I just bought this thing. But that shows you the difference between shiny new hardware and software updates. Now, Do you see what I'm saying? You have shiny new hardware. Right here in your heart, you've been given shiny new hardware. But you are still experiencing software updates, the renewing of the mind. So I wonder if you've captured what I'm saying today, 
this Easter, this Resurrection Sunday, do you see it that you're clean and you're close and you're new? And that newness is right here. You need to take the one foot journey from head to heart. The Bible tells us to live from the heart and give from the heart. The religious world says your heart is wicked, Christian. Your heart is desperately, deceitfully wicked. And God says, no, your heart is new. I want you to give freely from the heart and live from the heart and love others from the heart because I've given you a new heart. Are you ready to listen? Not to the Bible belt, but to the Bible. Are you ready to listen to God himself about what he has to say concerning you? You are clean and you are close and you are new because of the resurrection life of Jesus Christ in you. We have more to celebrate than the cross. The cross is incredible. Friday is amazing. But today is Sunday. Let's graduate to that third day. Let's celebrate the fullness of Christ's finished work. Let's count ourselves alive to Jesus because we are clean and we are close and we are new. You are a testimony, a walking testimonial to the fact that Jesus has risen from the dead. You're not making those long distance phone calls to heaven. They're local. Christ in you, the mystery now revealed. What is it that causes a person who is totally forgiven, totally accepted, totally loved, and completely saved, no matter what, what is it that causes them to behave? What is it that causes them to bear fruit? Where's the motivation? I mean, think about it. They're forgiven and accepted and loved and saved and secure, no matter what. So why behave? Here's the reason. Because they've been filled and sealed with the resurrection life of Jesus. The only reason we bear fruit is because Jesus came out of that tomb. He's alive today. And he made you clean. He made you close. And he made you new. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for Jesus Christ. We thank you for that cross. We agree with you that we are totally forgiven people. We love you, Father. We thank you for the blood. We thank you for the death of Jesus. It is enough. It is finished. It's over. We are forgiven past, present, and future. Forgiven forever, for all time. Wow. All we can do is have faith in that and say wow. And yet there's more. Father, we thank you for day three, for the resurrection, that we are now alive. We're more than forgiven. We're close and we're new. We thank you, Father, for this incredibly empowering and inspiring work of Jesus Christ. We love you. We praise you. We thank you this Resurrection Sunday. In Jesus' name, amen.